look, I'd now like to invite our panel speakers uh, up to the stage. Um, we're going to talk about the future of identity. Our chair um, and our other guests as well. Thank you. Fantastic. So our guests for um, this panel, our chair will be Nigel Latter. Uh, Alan Bell, who is the Digital Identity Transformation Program Manager for the Department of Internal Affairs. David Lacey, whom we uh, had the privilege of listening to earlier this morning, Managing Director of ID Care. Brandon Murdoch, Partner Engineer, Identity Division from Microsoft. And of course, Pamela Dingle as well. So, the future of identity. Let's get that slider rocking and rolling. Um, and uh, let's make this a really interesting panel session. So one of the reasons that I don't like chairing panel discussions is because I'm not a very organised person. And so because I have that anxiety, I prepare a lot. So what I need, tend to do is type out a couple of pages of notes and I put that in my back pocket. But then because I'm an idiot, sometimes what I do is I go to have morning tea and I drop it somewhere between upstairs and here. So I have some interesting little biographical facts about our panellists, which I don't have anymore, so I think I'm just going to assume them. <laughs> I'm just going to assume them on their behalf, because I don't have the ones that I prepared. So Alan Bell, what's Alan? I mentioned before, works at Department, Department of Internal Affairs. Uh, an interesting little fact that you may not know about, about Alan is that he began his career as a lion tamer in New Zealand in the 80s. <laughs> and was just shit at it, <laughs> forgot to close the cage, bunch of people got eaten, Winston Peter's mum was one of them, so that was a bit sad, and so after that he thought maybe technology for him. David Lacey that we've met from, uh, from Australia, from ID Care. David, interesting fact about David that you may not know, is that David uh, in his spare time makes YouTube videos where he goes and taunts active volcanoes. So if you go on YouTube and, and, and you type in David Calls Volcanoes Names, there are some hilarious videos of him just hurling abuse at volcanoes. It's genius. Um, Brandon Murdoch, obviously from uh, Microsoft, who uh, began his career at Microsoft with um, what some people said was a crazy idea, trying to, to power the internet with kittens. But what they found was they just couldn't get them in the wood chipper. Do you know what I mean? They just kept scampering out. <laughs> so he moved on from there to blockchains. And, um, and, and Pamela Dingle from Canada, who was, uh, in her sort of sporting life, um, a, a, a world champion speed giraffe shooter, which she competed in the 1982 Olympics and that. It's, a lot of people, it doesn't make good tallies, so they don't tend to show, but basically they just let a bunch of giraffes out and then they just shoot the bejesus out of them. And um, you can find footage online of Pamela and she was just, she just obliterate them. Bunch of giraffes, they just say go bang, 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 dead. Little baby giraffe going, oh. <laughs> she'd, she'd finish the little baby one off last. So, yeah, just some interesting little facts there just to, make it, just to make us feel like we all know each other a little bit more so that you can throw your conversations in. So what I thought I'd do is start with this. I mean, so my, my background is telly, and when we go and meet people to do interviews, we tend to, s to ask a sort of an establishing kind of question, and I normally do my, oh, if you could do this in about 30 seconds, that'd be really great, because anything longer than that we won't use. Um, so just, if we could just go through, and you could each talk about, so in, fr from your perspective, how do you conceive of identity uh, in, the, in the context of the conversation that we're having at the moment? But as we start the end, Brandon and, and, and come down. 30 seconds, identity, your time starts now. This is when I look at the camera and go, I don't know if this is going to make the cut. <laughs> Identity is new control play. It is the thing that is going to unlock value for us as people. And it's actually how do we go about doing that and how do we help people see that and actually make them part of the value exchange. See, that's good, Telly. Pam. Uh. I would just like to say the identity of the giraffes were very important to me. I, it was I, actually quite disturbing. Like, she would ask their names before the competition. That's right. What's your that's name? exactly right. Brian. Nice to meet you, Brian. <laughs> yes, right. They all had identifiers. 
Um, no, I, to me, identity, so I've been working in identity for 25 years. And I started because I was simply installing software. And one day, one day it occurred to me that behind that software were real people and that those people weren't always benefiting from the software that we were throwing in front of them. So uh, to me, identity means uh, <clears throat> two things. It means enabling us to do more and it means protecting us uh, from each other. Those two things are, uh, you know, the, the two sides of the coin in identity, protection uh, and, you know, the access, right? Access to the right things at the right time, but also enablement to get on with our day, to do the things we need to do and stop being con constantly interrupted by our software. Alan. To me, identity is about citizens and humans, and I really think about government's role in the protection of citizens from harms and the um, security of citizens and how digital identity is taking us down um, and presenting us with many new problems to solve. So it's about each and every one of us and it's about engaging in a language which ordinary people can understand because there's an elite that talk about this stuff that don't really connect with ordinary people and I think that's a major failing of this community. David. Um, for me, it's in the eye of the beholder. So, uh, for most people, it, it means a, a transactional opportunity or access. Um, others, it's about expressing their rights, to, so right to vote. Um, it's a very personal, uh, I think, thing, uh, but it's also transactional. And I don't call it an ecosystem, I don't think that's the right term, I think it's more an economy. It's, it's traded, you know, it's, it's bought and sold, and it has a value beyond the person. So, I mean, if you, if you think about that, in terms of this idea that, that giving people more control of their own data and blah, 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 what's the motivation for corporates to do that when kind of data is the business model, right? I mean, break it down, it's like data is the business, that's the value, that's the stuff. So why would, why would a corporation want to give me back my data when it can, it can use it to, kind of, to, to target me? I'm looking at you, Pamela. <laughs> I think I'll take that one. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think there's a number of reasons. Uh, so nobody set out to collect data. If you think about how, how we have evolved, how, you know, if, if we just start with the web and don't even look farther back than that, you know, nobody set, set about collecting large troves of data. It came about because uh, business was being conducted. And so... You know, any company anywhere needs a certain amount of information to do business. Uh, the question becomes not so much when do they collect, it becomes when do they let go. And I would say that we are very good at collecting and very bad at forgetting. And part of that is a, is a technology failure. Um, we have requirements for availability that mean that we clutch that data close to us in case we need it. Uh, and it, you know, different types of software and services have different needs for different types of data. Um, but we're moving into a new world where we are in a world now where connectivity is good enough that we can ask for data when we need it. That's, you know, arguably a, f a new phenomenon. So the concept of perishability, that you can actually forget something and get it back when you need it, is to me... Um, a conversation that needs to have and that has never been something that people have been comfortable enough or co corporations until now have been comfortable enough to, uh, to acknowledge unless it's regulated. A perfect example of that is PCI, right? You, the, the, for payments, you are required to ask for a credit card number and then you are required to forget all of it except usually the last four digits. So there is a precedent. It just has never filtered its way uh, all the way through. So, I mean, David, it's someone who works at the sharp end of, uh, you know, the, the ragged end of identity theft, is the trade at the moment fair? Is the what we get when we give our stuff, is, it, is, it, is that balance fair, do you think? I don't think it's transparent. You know, I don't, think, I don't think the consumer has any view as to where their identity information is. And I think the, those that, that are looking for new markets and new opportunities in this commodification of identity, which is the world we live in, may be thinking to themselves, well, 
I, I've got an idea for a product, I'll tell the consumer where their data is and, and give them a sense that they're in better control of it. I think that's driving a lot of behaviours at the moment. I think it's, it's, there's a convenience around the growth of identity theft to that argument, um, but, but it's an asymmetric marketplace, which means that different actors in the market have a different view of, of where identity information resides and how it's used and, and what comes of it. I've got no idea how much money organisations are making from my identity, but I'm sure they're making money. I just don't have that transparency. So, Alan, is that lack of transparency, is that my fault because I don't ask? Is it the corporation's fault because they don't tell me? Or is it the government's fault because they're not protecting me? I think it's probably all our faults in various ways. I think, um, you know, my, my focus is on what is the government's role. I reflect on regulation coming out of Europe, GDPR, open banking, all designed to give greater transparency to the consumer, to the citizen. I think government generally lags behind new technologies that come through. Uh, legislative change is slow in comparison to the new technologies. We've got to do something about that. So, but it, you know, the role of government is to protect citizens from harm and security. That's a very basic, fundamental role of government, and, and we have to step up to the plate and accept our role in that. Um, but it is, the la I talk about the language. You know, it's, there's an education thing here for decision makers. There's an education for citizens. There's a growing understanding of, of, of what the risks are, what the harms are, and then a, an understanding of the appropriate response to it. Something that doesn't absolutely crush the economy, but actually supports the economy, but appropriately <coughs> protects people. So it's a, a difficult thing, and that's the sort of space that we sort of inhabit, trying to interpret. When we hear the latest, greatest thing coming from, whether it's Microsoft or Google or whatever, how do we interpret that for decision makers, and how do we make sense of that, and how do we give um, compelling, empirically sought um, advice for governments so they can actually make the correct decisions? You know, a lot of the times, sorry to finish very quickly, a lot of the times we hear, oh, why do we have a minister of blockchain or a minister of that? Governments in a liberal democracy don't tend to make huge leaps of faith. They look for evidence, they look for proof, because they have to protect citizens. That's why they do it. So, uh, Brandon, uh, like, um, what I'm interested in is how do we get past that paradox of, uh, like, I'm a human, and so I was listening to two of you talking, I thought, oh, they're from Microsoft, but they seem, they're this huge multi, but they seem very nice people. You know, and so the human in me goes. The human, the human in me goes. Like somebody go, oh bloody Microsoft. I go, no, I was it a thing? There were two people. They seem very nice. Um, <laughs> you know, but so how would I? And, and and it sounds fantastic, and I get it. And it's uh, I don't even know what blockchain is. It's little blocks of stuff that are chained together. It seems like it's a good thing. Um, <laughs> But how do how do I as a consumer know? So if say if we invent this amazing system of things, how do I? How do I even? How will I even know that I can trust this thing? Because it'll it'll give me, it'll be a little thing on my phone. It'll go, you're safe now, and I'll go, cool. I mean, that's that is part of the whole conversation that we're having. That's you know, how do you trust corporations? That is what we are now. It's about that trust relationship that we have with consumers, with enterprises, and that's very hard to earn, very quick to lose. Um, and that's one of the fundamental conversations that we're having around this space. We know technology can solve these problems, but actually how do we engender trust? How do we embody trust that people are, will trust these systems in place? And that comes through transparency, by engaging with people, not being, and I saw a question popped up there about, you know, it's very tech driven. Um, and it is this chicken and egg situation. We're trying to avoid that. We're trying to actually engage with people who are going to use us right from the outset and understand what their needs are and what they, what they need from a system that will actually give them trust and understanding how it's working. They need to know all the little bits and bobs that it's this zeros and ones on this chain and all that, but it's actually how is this behaving on behalf of me? Um, and, you, and you know, we have conversations, you know, you look at things, you know, at Microsoft we talk about Microsoft Word. You know, we put Microsoft in front of Word, and some of the conversations we're having now, do we have to, we have to be brave as an organization and say, well, maybe it needs to be Word by Microsoft. And that has, you know, it changes. It's about people trusting that it's theirs and we've done it for, on their behalf. And I, I don't, we don't have an answer for that at the moment. That's something we're exploring, but we're inc acutely aware that trust is easily lost. So we're trading very carefully and trying to build trust and be very transparent about what we're doing. And that's why we're here. That's why we're doing it out in the open on DIFF. Um, what, I, what I'm interested in is, is government as potentially a trust anchor 
for some of this. Government providing the rules and regulations around it that citizens can trust. And working with, appropriately with the private sector to make sure that standards, for example, there is no real global standards yet around digital identity. They're developing, they're nascent, they're coming through. When you don't have that maturity, you know, government has got a, a role to play in helping to develop. We play a role in, in the ISO and various other standard setting bodies. Um, so it's got to mature. We've got to look around it and make sure it's mature. And government has a role in there to act on behalf of the citizens to make sure there are rules. And yes, and don't forget, government always usually is at the uh, is a, is a source of authoritative data. But how is that authoritative data shared by consent? citizens and the social license of citizens to do that in order to make your life easier if that's what you want. You know, so we need to be able to connect. That's why when we talk about connecting, you know, we've got to be able to connect in a language which people understand. You talk about it's not visible. Yeah. I think it's not visible because people hear some of the conversations and they just close down. Double blinding, you know, all this stuff that we talk about in the community and they, what the heck? No one talks about this over the Christmas dinner table. How do we get people to talk about it? in an informed way. That's a challenge for you. So but one of the things we've seen, you know, we as technicians, we've used the words here, we use identity and data interchangeably. And there was an interesting thing on this, they did one of these street surveys in the UK a couple of months ago, and they were asking people, what did identity mean to them? And it was their passport, their driving license. They didn't consider the data that they were accruing through their digital actions as identity. We know it is, but they don't. So you know, we first got to get them over that hurdle and I think we as technologists need to get better about disambiguating between the two. Otherwise, people don't, you know, maybe that needs government regulation to say, actually, this is what data means. This is what identity means. David, is trust, is trust even something, is it a valid construct to be measuring? Because like you work in, a, your, your whole business is people who have, it's easy to get people to trust. I mean, we were talking about it just there. It's like, if you don't have a conscience, it would be so easy to make a shitload of money in the world because it's easy to get people to trust you and to give you money. Yeah. Should, is trust even something... Where does, it, where does it fit in, in your view? Yeah, it is. It's uh, certainly in terms of the, the impacts on individuals, there's a, a massive trust deficit that's created when their identity is stolen and misused. Uh, those that don't know the source of the compromise often display quite extreme distrust behaviours. So, so we're, we're doing some work at the moment with a university on what we're calling e-rescue me which is about offering people ironically remote access to their desktops to see what criminals might have done when they got remote access to their desktop. <laughs> um, and that's pushing the boundaries of trust. But uh, what we find is a local IT shop is looking for the wrong thing. Crooks aren't using malware. They're getting remote access to devices and keeping audio and, and video streams going. So it's very common for us to come across a client where they're literally still recording. And, and that, that has an enormous trust impact for that individual and their family. And we, it takes time, and, and for organisations that might be the last point of embarkation, whether it be a bank or a telco, um, you know, we do ask our clients whether they'd remain a customer if they had the choice, um, particularly you know, data breach clients, um, and how an organisation behaves and how centralised they put that customer in their response influences that. So it seems one of the one of the difficult, difficult difficulties in talking about the stuff is it's enormously complex, um, and there are all sorts of uh, sort of complicated bits of it. And, and most of New Zealand isn't here. Most of, and most of New Zealand don't understand half of the issues that everyone here is familiar with and understands. So there's a really good question: relanguage and education. Does the panel know of helpful or unhelpful metaphors or analogies for explaining, e.g., privacy, blockchain, digital identity? Like, what's how do you explain digital identity to people who've got no freaking idea what that is? I think most people think you mean my login and my password. How do you explain that? Pamela, thoughts? Uh, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I have a very technical, you know, I work in a very technical world. And standards, uh, you know, we're not so much dreamers as we are definers. And so, you know, we spend two weeks in, you know, Singapore deciding, you know, exactly the character string length and whether it can have apostrophes in it and, and all of these sort of things. So uh, we, we have very specific digital identities um, that, in our, are in theory interoperable across judicial uh, legislative domains. And 
we don't expect any of that to reach anyone in this room. It, is, it just isn't the way to talk about it. Um, but I will say, I don't think my definition can do anything except make everyone else's definitions talk to each other. The definition of digital identity is um, something I've been trying to get for something that will actually work with people for a long time, you know. So my, my favorite one, which may not resonate with anyone, is that it's the wiring behind the wall. You know, it's, um, it's, it's something that makes your lights turn on. It's what happens behind the scenes. What do you need to know about digital identity is that someone is making sure it's done to the right standard, that it actually, um, <coughs> the rules of the, of the, of, are being followed, and someone is checking that they're doing that. You're not interested in the detail of that. You're interested in what lights can be turned on and what spotlights you can use and what you can actually choose. We've also described it as a foundational piece for uh, the transformation of digital government, for the for digital economy. We've tried many ways of explaining it. None really res resonates with, I've tested it with my family and why other people, they want what? You know, they, we, we, because it is that sort of enabling technology. It doesn't actually in itself deliver a lot of stuff. It enables a lot of stuff. So it's that foundational piece, vitally important to put it in and needs to be explained and understood as a foundational piece. And we need to make sure government decision makers can actually, and ministers can actually understand that it, it is so important to have it right and to have the rules and standards correct around it so you can then build on it. So in terms of the balance between legislation and people making their own choices, where should it be? How much of this should be Alan saying? <laughs> and how much of it should be you guys saying? And how much of it should be me going, mm -hmm. I, Well, I'm not saying it should be Alan saying it. I'm saying it should be the citizen saying it. I'm really clear here, Nigel, don't put words in my mouth. So, um, <laughs> I, what I'm saying is it needs to be a discussion with citizens, and it needs to be citizens need to have an informed discussion about it, and we need to find a lexicon which can allow that to happen. Because if we talk in the way we talk, we're never going to connect with anyone. And then ministers need to have the, the information to decide, and we need to, it's a global thing. Mm -hmm. We need to think about it globally, we need to think about the breadth of it, it's not just government, it's the whole of the economy. It's a real driver for, for change and, for, and for, for digital transformation. How do we get that information across to people and allow people to tell us what they want? And it's an, it's, it's an odd thing, right? So how many people log into Facebook just for the sake of logging into Facebook or Google? We don't. We're trying to transact. We're trying to do something. We're task oriented and driven. And I think for this to be successful, identity actually almost has to just disappear into the background. Um, so you know, when we talk about blockchain, actually, people don't care about that. They don't want to know about. It. They want to know that they can get on and transact. And when they transact, there are certain things. Like when I buy something along with my credit card, I want to know that my credit card is not being compromised as part of that transaction. It's being used elsewhere. So how do we actually? And so we were talking about a couple of great conversations we've had this week have been about. Well, decentralized identity? Well, no, it's actually, yeah, if we have to have identity in the term, which I think we need to maybe even try and get away from, it's digital identity done better. That's what it is. It's not blockchain identity. It's not self-sovereign. It's just identity that has these properties. And that's how we need to start to talk to people and actually help people understand. It's unfortunately, technology is still projecting into that realm at the moment. Yeah. I think there's one analogy that might be valuable, <clears throat> or, or maybe even two, and those are, <clears throat> Closed lines and guardrails. So if you think what your identity is, your identity is, is a line that runs through time. And you know, um, every persona you have, every facet of who you are, starts and runs and possibly ends, possibly doesn't end. And so it is this line through space that you get to clip things to um, that, you know, that, that reels along and represents who you are. Uh, so to me, the, you know, from an organizational perspective, you have this concept of provisioning, which is where a corporation, you know, you hire a person, and that particular look, close line starts, right? And you're going to hook all these attributes and entitlements, all these things to this person. It's going to change over time, and at some point they are terminated, and that close line stops. I don't know if that's useful uh, for you all. And then the other one is guide, guardrails. So the whole point of legislation it is to be a guardrail. Right? It isn't to stop productivity, it's to keep us going in a direction that's valuable for everyone. And, and, safe. I, and safe. And, safe. and I, I think that's good for everyone. I don't think you know, 
anyone will argue that having those guardrails means that we all can benefit. So David, if someone, again, so you deal with the human face of the stuff, right? So for you, it's not numbers and statistics, it's an actual person whose life has been ruined and blah, blah. Well, what would, what's your view about where the line should be in terms of legislation versus personal responsibility? Well, if, you know, in the absence of having any real legislation aside from a Privacy Act that defines organisational behaviour when identity is compromised, I don't think we can leave it to the market. You know, I mean, that the, the, un, the unadvertised view of the counsellors and psychologists of ID care is if you're not harmed by the crime, you most certainly will be by the response. That's the reality. It's not the exception of the rule, that's the rule. So I think the market's behaving in that way. Um, so, you know, having discussions like these and promulgating ideas throughout your organisations hopefully might, might shift a bit of that. What we see is uh, at least for the percentage that have their identity stolen, that, that reach that distrust point around loyalty and being an enduring customer, what seems to influence that is their response experience. And, and so if, when we promote hard within organisations, you know, here is your opportunity to actually reinforce loyalty as a measure. So we, we collect what we call net promoter scores, which a lot of private sector organisations, executives are, are remunerated on. And the net promoter score for a New Zealand response system at the moment is 3.93 out of 10. That's the net promoter score. So that means anything kind of four and below means you're harming the customer. And we, we look, that hasn't really shifted in five years. So, so if distilling all of that, an observation is, legislation can assist in lifting standards, then maybe that might be part of the solution. But I think the rea reality for private sector organisations and public sector organisations is you've got an opportunity to really add some customer value in, 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 in the face of this. Why is it that we're so shit at dealing with this stuff and we don't hear about it? Like, that's because appalling. A, I mean, you've told stories that I just think are appalling. It's like, how is it that we don't know this stuff as a country? Well, one, one uh, uh, until we arrived, there was no central point to aggregate this view. I think secondly, the system is decentralised. So I, I am a customer of many organisations, most of whom don't talk to each other. So it's up to me. It's, it's when you look at that information and task network, it's all on me. So, so it's a little wonder it sort of slips under the radar. It's just too hard. Yeah. It's too hard for people. Like I, you're too, people are too busy. You know, when I'm not thinking about this, which is my job to think about it in my private life, I have no time for this. Who's got, you, you mentioned that when we had a, had a chat, you don't have time to work through who's doing what and who's selling what and how has it worked and read the conditions of every time you go onto a website. No one has got time for that. You've got to simplify it. We've got to find a way to connect with people in a language which they understand about the real core issues. And at the core of all this, I think it's about trust and confidence. We touched on, previous speakers have touched on Cambridge Analytica and various other things. Trust and confidence. To my mind, government's role is about protecting that trust and confidence and, making the, and providing advice and making decisions that enhance that trust and confidence, not just in government, but in the economy and the ability to do business and transact. It's going to become even more important when we get to the Internet of Things, when their identities are just abound. They're just going to exponentially grow. We've got to find a way of having a much richer conversation. We cannot allow it to be a small group, no offence, of engineers talking to other engineers. So if, if, if it, and I don't think it can be felt trust, because felt trust is meaningless. If, so how, how do we have demonstrable trust? Like how do we have a system so that people who don't understand nothing about technology can go, oh yep, that's all right, I can do that. How do we do that? I ask this as a naive person who doesn't know how we do that. Well, I go, I go back to the government's role as a basic role to protect and provide security and to protect people from harms. There has to be an element of protecting the trust and, and confidence across the economy. And, it, and they must protect the economy to make it grow, help it grow and do that stuff. Regulation happens, you look at all the sort of industrial revolutions, all the technology revolutions that we've had, governments have always regulated in some way after the new technologies have appeared. I think we're in that process now. We've got all these big platform players, we've got all these new powerful, and, and um, asymmetries of power that are developing. We need to understand that much better and we need to be able to think about what is the correct way to create the conditions to allow 
the economy to grow safely, to allow standards to be globalised, and to make sure that people are informed and have an informed discussion about that. Nice and easy. Should take a year. I'm joking. <laughs> We define so where does accountability fit into all this? So who's accountable if 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 things go wrong? If a company drops the ball, if information gets out, if your stuff is compromised, who is accountable for that? Should it be are, are, are fines the, the the way to go? Should it, should it be big fines? Is that how we punish people who drop the ball? David, you look thoughtful. Um, well, it's, GDPR is energising a lot of thinking at the moment, so that's probably the biggest stick around town. Uh, the Australian. Uh, so Angeline and her team in Australia as a privacy commissioner has yet to sort of flex their muscles in any real way. They kind of have a 12 to 18 month bedding in process. I think, look, 10K is a joke, right? So I know you might revisit it in 12 months time, but it's just, people just don't take that seriously. I think, um, I think that's, that's an opportunity lost. I think choice and transparency are key as consumers. I bought this phone because I want to communicate with staff and my family. I didn't buy this phone to be cyber safe, but I now have to be cyber safe. And it's a bit like that with your identity. It's a bolt-on retrospective thought mm. to a main game, which is not about identity. It's about accessing a service. So upfront, having more user-friendly information about what this other game is may be a start. You know, we, we could, in ID care, name and shame. We could tell you, without a doubt, who's naughty and who's nice. But we prefer to work with organisations privately about that. And that's having some, some change. I mean, we're seeing some good change in Australia. We've got a bit of work to do here. Yeah, which someone said, massive fines in Europe uh, due to GDPR have really focused on organisations' minds on protecting privacy. Why didn't New Zealand follow that lead? Because we're talking about this before, Pam. Like, if I decide to go tandem sky jumping and I jump out of a plane, then that's my, I, I make that decision. But what I make the decision thinking, well, I live in a country where that's regulated and I know that there are going to be people making sure the plane's okay and this dude should know what he's doing and someone's packed the chute and stuff like that. Um, but it seems like, this is some of your stories, David, people jump on the internet, you're jumping out of a plane all the time and you don't know if there's even a parachute in the thing. They go, come on, jump with me, there's a parachute. So where, where is the, and they, you know, if I die in a parachute accident, they'll get fined the bejesus out of them. Um, in your view, where, the, where, does, where does all that sit? Like, are fines going to be enough? Should, should they be bigger? Fines are not enough. They're clearly not enough. Um, I'm amazed, actually, that this whole two days, the one term, you know, in all the buzzwords we've talked about, I don't think I've ever heard privacy by design once. And, you know, here's the, the truth. I will tell you the absolute truth, and that is that companies get breached. And no matter how hard we try, no matter how much we invest, there, is always, there are determined attackers who are after the data and who can find the data and who can pull the data out. And so um, no company can guarantee, no matter what they invest, no matter what they promise, they cannot guarantee that, they're, that they don't lose some data. But what we can do is we can guarantee that we have taken absolutely every step that we know how to take in order to protect data. We can uh, learn from our mistakes. We can in notify immediately and you know a lot of those things so gdpr is has had a global repercussion because certainly for global companies like ours we you know we are in fact you know all of our customers benefit because gdpr was put into place it gave us a way to focus on what we could achieve in a short period of time it gave us a forcing function to do so so i you know i don't think anyone at microsoft would disagree that uh, the things that happened as a result of GDPR are good. Um, we will continue to work to do that. Um, but, but we are creating a trust that, that has to be uh, a give and take. And you know, we never ever want anything bad to happen. But we absolutely want to be held accountable for the fact that we've done our absolute best to keep things safe. So to me, um, you know, the more we can do as an industry around privacy by design, the more we can hold folks accountable, uh, and the more that we can find the ways in which we didn't do a good job and, and fix those things, an in iterative uh, improvement. I think that's, that's how we have to move forward. So, Brian, if you, what, what would you say is the biggest obstacle to actually being able to effectively protect online at the moment? Like, what are the obstacles in the way at the moment? 
jobs. <laughs> Engineers. Yeah, that's what I want to say. <laughs> you know, it's not because we're evil people. I don't think I'm evil. I think I'm quite a nice guy, actually. But, you know, when you get, you know, we set ourselves a goal. And we are. We're all goal orientated beings. Well, and there's been some interesting. Maybe we're not all. But, you know, on a whole, we're goal oriented. We're trying to achieve something. And, you know, we become so focused, we get so tunneled by that. And I think, you know, privacy by design, there are certain things that we actually need to do right from the start. And we're starting to learn that muscle. We're building significant processes at Microsoft. We work in a culture now where we assume breach. It's just how do we find it? How we, and that's, it's a change in the mind shift. And as an engineer, people are trying to just, just implement things. It's a very, very different approach. And that takes time to change the culture within engineering. Um, and you know, we're working with lots of other cloud operators. But there's no point in us just solving on our own, because then people will go to AWS or they will go to Google. It just changes that attack vector. Um, and for me at the moment, that's probably the biggest. I'm sure there are lots of other things. But you know, for me, it's educating and having people who are building and implementing this stuff change their view and approach. Well, engineers should never be allowed to fly the plane. So it's an old saying, you know, you've got to be, be careful. Engineers are too <laughs> down in the detail. And that's what I mean when I talk about how do we actually get it up to the level at which decision makers can make sense of this very complicated stuff. And it has to be simple and it has to be easily understood. And um, we have to have that conversation. That's why I, and you and I, Brendan, but many discussions over this, you know, and uh, I've attended many conferences about it. You know, I end up usually howling at the moon about I'm talking to the same people about the same thing over and over and over again. I want to talk to different people about different things and about what it means to them. And I think that, that getting that conversation going, getting an understanding of um, what citizens genuinely feel from organisations like yourself, maybe you should be open and transparent and, and name and shame. Maybe there should be more honesty across, all, I'm not saying you're dishonest, but maybe there should be more honesty and more visibility across all of this stuff so we can make informed decisions, you know. So I want to have that conversation with different people. David, I think your the thoughts? Government wants us to know more shame. <laughs> uh, I didn't say. <laughs> uh, I, I, look, for me, it's it's a it's a global identity economy, and it's really hard for a country like this one, and the country that's next door, to to shape an influence on that global scale. And it is a it is a consumer focused service delivery environment, and the collateral damage is identity. And, and the opportunity that now presents is about designing things in a way where the citizen truly has choice through knowledge, through convenience, and not through 23 pages of a privacy statement no one's going to read. There might be opportunities for big gorillas and others to maybe annually report, well, where do they share their data? Where does your data go? I mean, as a consumer, I'd like to make money from the money they're making from me. You know, so I, I think there's plenty of opportunity there uh, to do good, and and I think mostly that starts with, you know, designing things in a way that 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 genuinely empowers consumers, and that might start with with transparency. Yeah, I would add to that only that that idea of of using language that that helps people understand is not just for end users. We need to do that for our IT staff. So we need to be able to clearly explain to, an, to the IT staff why they shouldn't take an Excel spreadsheet, load it up with social security numbers, and store it on their hard drive, or put it on a server, or have an FTP server sitting under their desk. I mean, all of these things, you know, I mean, as Brandon said, we are human, and we, you know, billions of us everywhere are trying to solve problems every day. And ultimately, what we need is for people to understand the consequences of the shortcuts that they might choose to make. So um, just to finish off, uh, again, if I return to Telego role, um, if I was making a documentary, and to be honest, the idea's been percolating around because it's super interesting stuff, um, about this whole concept of digital identity. Uh, and I was interviewing you, I said, look, we just, we, what we need is just a little sound bite for kind of the end, this is, the, this is part five, it's the, it's the round off of the show. We've laid out the issues, the problems. What's the thing that, uh, that, you, that the, for each of you, that you would, uh, you think the, the normal people, not these people, these smart people, I mean normal people, not that normal people aren't smart, if anyone's <laughs> tweeting that, they, they are, not all of them. Um, <laughs> but what would be the thing that you would uh, most want to kind of go out to the country if we were doing the roundup piece to camera at the end of a documentary? And again, we'll start at the end and wander down Brandon. 
speak up. I think citizens need to voice their concerns and actually have a hand in how we design their systems. Right. Uh, don't reuse passwords. <laughs> Use an MFA. That's my first advice for you to not have your account hacked and therefore keep your data at least that little bit safer. I think I would say digital identity is about trust and confidence and therefore it should be really important to you and you should get engaged with the, the conversation. I think everyone matters. Seeing as telly guy, I'd say, yes, can you just expand that a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> I know what you're saying, but yeah, for the purposes I mean, of this television every, piece. Everyone and their identity matters, and the system needs to uh, uh, afford for that and people's needs. There's 700,000 Australians that can't prove who they are at the moment using government credentials. So we can't lose them. I don't know what the figure is here, but I'm sure that there's a cohort. Crikey. Um, well, we, are, we have 28 seconds to go, which means I'm out of time to ask the question I really wanted to ask, which is about the email that I received that apparently some bloke somewhere has infected my computer with a virus, and it's awkward. He's been videoing me for the last year, and there's no point tracing him because he's quite clever. He's, he, he's done blockchain something or other. Um, and I have to blockchain him a whole bunch of money, or he's going to show the videos that he's recorded of me watching something in the right-hand side of the screen and pleasuring myself on the left-hand side of the screen. And I've, which doesn't make any sense because I've, I've, I'm quite neutral about the left and right side of my screen. Uh, I don't, but I'm assuming it's legit because it was from an email address, so it must be. So I'll just, at a time, I'll just send him some stuff. Um, so yeah, it seems like a good place to stop slightly awkwardly talking about pornography and being blackmailed. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Someone, someone realised I'm not a cat person. Um, it's not that I'm not a cat person, it's just that I have the same concern for them that they have for me, which is none. You know, like... <laughs> I'm not like Pamela, I'm not going to go out and shoot them all, I'm not going to feed them into a chipper uh, like Brandon, but I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm neither for nor against them, I'm just, I'm feline neutral. Um, that was super interesting. I have to say that uh, one of the things I will be going back uh, to Auckland thinking about is um, here's this huge issue that, um, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff today that has made me think a whole lot about a whole lots of different things, and I do think it's something that needs to be part of our national conversation. Um, and so I'm going to have a chat with our people about, uh, you know, about, I think it would be a super interesting documentary, this concept of identity and what it is and where it goes and what people are doing to um, help us with that. So uh, thank you, Brandon uh, and Pamela, Alan uh, and David, uh, and thank you all for listening, uh, which always makes it easier. <laughs>